Chapter 11 The Rate and Mass of Surplus Value In this chapter, as hitherto, the value of labour power and therefore the part of the working day necessary for the reproduction or maintenance of that labour power is assumed to be given a constant magnitude. With this presumption, the rate of surplus value directly gives us the mass of surplus value furnished by the capitalist, by the worker, within a definite period of time. If, for example, the necessary labour amounts to six hours a day, expressed in a quantity of gold equal to three shillings, then three shillings is the daily value of one labour power or the value of the capital advanced to buy one labour value, labour power. If further, the rate of surplus value is 100%, this variable capital of three shillings produces a mass surplus value of three shillings. In other words, the worker supplies every day a mass of surplus labour of six hours. But the variable capital is the monetary expression for the total value of all the labour powers the capitalist employs simultaneously. Its value is therefore equal to the average value of one labour power multiplied by the number of labour powers employed. With a given value of labour power, therefore, the magnitude of a variable capital varies directly with the number of workers employed simultaneously. If the daily value of one labour power is three shillings, then a capital of 300 shillings must be advanced in order to exploit 100 labour powers every day. And a capital of n times 3 shillings must be advanced in order to exploit n labour powers every day. In the same way, if a variable capital of 3 shillings, being the daily value of one labour power, produces a daily surplus value of 3 shillings, a variable capital of 300 shillings will produce a daily surplus value of 300 shillings. And one n times, shil n times 3 shillings will produce a daily surplus value of n times 3 shillings. The mass of surplus value produced is therefore equal to the, sur the surplus value provided by the working day of one worker multiplied by the number of workers employed. But as the mass of surplus value, which is a single, which a single worker produces, the value of labour power being given, is determined by the rate of surplus value. This first law follows: the mass of mass of surplus value produced is equal to the amount of variable capital advanced multiplied by the rate of surplus value. In other words, the mass of surplus value is determined by the product of the number of labour powers simultaneously exploited by the same capitalist and the degree of exploitation of each individual labour power. Let the mass of surplus value be S. The surplus value supplied by the individual worker in the average day S, the variable, variable capital advanced daily in the purchase of one individual labour power, V, the sum of the total variable capital, V, and the value of an average labour power, P. Its degree of exploitation, surplus value, surplus labour, divided by necessary labour, and the number of workers employed, N, we have a very long equation. We assume throughout not only that the value of an average labour power is constant, but that workers employed by a capitalist are reduced to average workers. There do exist exceptional cases in which the surplus value produced does not increase in proportion to the number of workers being exploited. But then, the value of the labour power does not remain constant. In the production of a definite mass of surplus value, therefore, as a decrease in one factor may be compensated for, an in compensated for by an increase in the other. If the variable capital diminishes, 
and at the same time the rate of surplus value increases in the same ratio, the mass of surplus value remains unaltered. If on our early assumption the capitalist has to advance 300 shillings in order to exploit 100 workers each day and the rate of surplus value amounts to 50%, this variable capital of 300 shilling yields a surplus value of 150 shillings or 100 times 3 working hours. If the rate of surplus value doubles or the working day instead of being extended from 6 to 9 it's extended from 6 to 12 hours and at the same time variable capital is reduced by half i.e. to 100 shillings it too yields a surplus value of One hundred and fifty shillings, or fifty times six working hours. A decrease in the variable capital may therefore be compensated for by a proportionate rise in the degree of exploitation of labour power, or a decrease in the number of workers employed by a proportion. The labour which is set in motion by the total capital of a society day in day out may be regarded as a single working day. If, for example, the number of workers is a million and the average working day is 10 hours, the social working day will consist of one of 10 million hours with a given length of this working day, whether its limits are fixed physically or socially by the mass of surplus value can be increased by only increasing the number of workers, i.e. the size of the working population. The growth of population here forms a mathematical limit to the production of surplus value by the total social capital, and inversely, with a given population, this limit is formed by the possible lengthening of the working day. It will, however, be seen in the next chapter that this law holds only for the form of surplus value dealt with up to the present. From the foregoing treatment of the production of social of surplus value, it follows that not every sum of money or value can be transformed into capital at will. In fact, it is a presumption of this transformation that a certain minimum amount of money or exchange value is in the hands of the individual possessor of money or commodities. The minimum of variable capital is the cost price of a single labour power employed the whole de year through day in day out for the production of surplus value. If this worker were in possession of his own means of production and were satisfied to live as a worker, he could make do with the amount of labour time necessary to reproduce his means of subsistence, say eight hours a day. In addition to this, he would only need means of production sufficient for eight working hours. The capitalist, on the other hand, so, Ron, who makes him do, Would you stop shouting at me? Okay. besides these three hours, say four oh, hours of surplus sorry. value, of surplus labour, requires an additional sum of money for furnishing the additional means of production. On our assumption, however, he would have to employ not one, but two workers in order to live on the surplus value appropriated daily, as well as and no better than a worker, i.e. In order to be able to satisfy his needs, in this case the mere maintenance of his life would be the purpose of his production, not the increase of his wealth. But capitalist production presupposes the increase of wealth. To live only twice as well as an ordinary worker, as well as that t turn half of the surplus value produced into capital, he would have to multiply the number of workers and the minimum of the capitalist capital 
advance by eight. Of course he can, like the man who is working for him, participate directly in the process of production. But then he is only a hybrid, a man between capitalist and worker, a small master. A certain stage of capitalist production necessitates that the capitalist be able to devote the whole of the time during which he functions as a capitalist, i.e. as capital personified, to the appropriation and therefore the control of labour of others, and to the sale of products of that labour. The guild system of the Middle Ages therefore tried forcibly to prevent the transformation of the master of a craft into a capitalist by limiting the number of workers a single master could employ to a very low maximum. Hence, the possessor of the money or the commodities actually turns into a capitalist only where the minimum sum advanced for production greatly exceeds the known medieval maximum. Here, as in natural science, it is shown that the correctness of the law discovered by Hegel in his logic that at a certain point merely quantitative at a certain point merely quantitative differences pass over by a dialectical inversion into qualitative distinctions. The minimum of minimum sum of value the individual possessor of money or commodities must command in order to metamorphose himself into a capitalist changes with the different stages of development of capitalist production and is at given stages different in different spheres of production. According to their special technical conditions, certain spheres, even at the beginnings of capitalist production, require a minimum of capital which is not yet to be found in the hands of single individuals. This situation gives rise to, partly to the state subsidies to private persons, as in France in the time of Colbert and in some German states, right to an epoch, and partly to the formation of companies with a legally secured monopoly over the conduct of certain branches of industry and commerce, the forerunners of the modern joint stock companies. We shall not examine in detail the changes which take place in the relation between cap the capitalist and the wage labourer in the course of the process of production nor shall we deal any further with the characteristics of capital excess itself. Here we shall only emphasise certain main points. Capital developed within the production process until it acquired command over labour, i.e. over self-activating labour power, in other words, the worker himself. The capitalist, who is capital personified, now takes care that the worker does his work regularly and with the proper degree of intensity. Capital also developed into a coercive relation and this compels the working class to do more than would be required by the narrow circles of his own needs. As an agent in producing the activity of others, as an extractor of surplus value and an exploiter of labour power, it surpasses all earlier systems of production which were based on directly compulsory labour in its energy and its quantity of unbounded and ruthless activity. At first capital subordinates labour on the basis of the technical conditions within which labour has been carried on up to that point in history. It does not therefore directly change the mode of production. The production of surplus value in the form we have so far considered by means of simple extension of the working day appeared therefore independently of any change in the mode of production itself. It has no less effective it was no less effective 
in the old-fashioned bakeries than the modern cotton factories. If we consider the pr process of production from the point of view of the simple labour process, the worker is related to the means of production not in their qu quality as capital, but as being the mere means and material of his own purposeful productive activity. In tanning, for example, he deals with the skins as his simple object of labour. It is not the capitalist whose skin he tans, but it is di different as soon as the, we view the production process as a process of valorisation. The means of production are at once changed into the means for the absorb absorption of the labour of others. It is no longer the worker who employs the means of production, but the means of production which employ the worker. Instead of being consumed by him as material element of his productive activity, they consume him as the ferment necessary to their own life processes. The life processes of capital consist life process of capital consists solely in its own mo motion as self Oops, as self valorizing value. Furnaces and workshops that stand idle at night and absorb no living labour are a mere loss to the capitalist. Hence furnaces and workshops constitute lawful claims upon the night labour of labour powers. As soon as a certain sum of money is transformed into a means of production, i.e. the objective factors of the production process, the means of production there themselves are transformed into a title, both by right and by might, to the labour and surplus la labour of others. An example will show in conclusion how this inversion created this distortion which is peculiar and characteristic of capitalist production, of the relation between dead labour and living labour, between value and the force that creates value, is mirrored in the consciousness of the capitalist. During the English manufacturer's result, revolt of, the eight, of 1848 to 50, the head of one of the oldest and most respectable houses in the west of Scotland, Messrs Carlisle Sons & Co, of the linen and cotton thread factory at Paisley, a company which has now existed for about a century, which was in operation in 1752, and four generations of the same family have conducted it. This very intelligent gentleman wrote a letter printed in the da Glasgow Daily Mail of the 25th of April 1849 under the heading the relay system where the following grotesquely naive passage among others crept in let us know let us now see what evils will attend the limiting to 10 hours of the factory day they amount to the most serious damage the mill owner's prospect and property i.e. his hands work 12 hours before and is limited to 10 and then every 12 machines or spindles in this establishment sink shrink to 12, 10 and should the workers be disp dispossessed disposed of they will be valued at only 10 so that a sixth part would thus be deducted from the value of every factory in the country in this west of Scotland bourgeois brain, which has inherited the capitalist qualities of four generations, the value of means of production, spindles, etc., is so inextricably confused with the quality they possess as capital of valorising themselves, of swallowing up every day a definite quantity of the unpaid labour of others. Then that the head of the firm, Carl Arlenko, actually imagines that if he sells his factory, not only will the value of the spindles be paid to him, but in addition, their power of self-valorization 
not only the labour contained in them, which is necessary to the production of spindles of this kind, but so the surplus labour which they help to pump out daily from the brave Scots of Paisley. This is why he thinks that sh the shortening of the working day by two hours the selling price of 12 spinning machines dwindles to that of 10. <clears throat> Chapter 12. The concept of relative surplus value. That portion of the working day which merely produces an equivalent for the value paid by the capitalist for his labour power has up to this point been treated by us as a constant magnitude. And so it is, under given conditions of production and at a given stage in the economic development of society. As we saw, the worker could work for two, three, four, six, etc. hours beyond this, his necessary labour time. The rate of surplus value and the length of the working day depends on how far extra this time, extra time was prolonged. Although the necessary labour time was constant, we saw, on the other hand, the total, total working day was variable. Now suppose we have a working day whose length and whose division between necessary labour and surplus labour are given. Let the whole line AC represent, for example, a working day of 12 hours. The section AB represents 10 hours of necessary labour time and the BC represents two hours of surplus labour. How can the production of surplus value be increased? How can surplus labour be prolonged without any prolongation or independently of any prolongation of the line AC? Although the boundaries of the working day A and C are given, it would seem possible to lengthen the line BC other than by ex other than by extension beyond its end point C which is also the end of the working day AC by pushing back its starting point B in the direction of A assume that the line BB in the line is equal to half of BC or to do one hour's labour time now, if AC, the working day of 12 hours, we move point B to B dash, then BC becomes B dash C. The surplus labour increases by one half from two hours to three hours, although the working day remains 12 hours as before. This extension of the surplus labour time from BC to B dash C from two hours to three hours is however evidently impossible without simultaneous contradiction of the necessary labour time from AB to AB dash from ten hours to nine hours. The prolongation of surplus labour would correspond to a shortening of necessarily necessary labour, i.e. a proportion of labour time pre previously consumed, in reality, for the worker's own benefit, would be converted into labour time expended for the capitalists. There would be an alteration not in the length of the working day, but in its division into necessary labour time and surplus labour time. On the other hand, it is evident that the duration of surplus labour is given when the length of the working day and the value of labour power are given. The value of labour power, i.e. the labour time necessary to produce labour power, determines labour time necessary for the reproduction of the value of labour power. If one hour of work is embodied in sixpence and the value of a day's labour power is five shillings, the worker must work for ten hours a day in order to replicate the value paid by the capital, by capital for his labour power or to produce an equivalent for the value of means of subsistence he needs to consume every day. 
Given the value of these means of subsistence, the value of his labour power can be calculated and given the labour of his labour power, the duration of his necessary labour time. The duration of surplus labour, however, is arrived by subtracting the necessary labour time from the total working day, from 10 hours to 12 leaves 2, and it's not easy to see under the given conditions the surplus labour can, can possibly be prolonged beyond two hours. No doubt the capitalist could instead of five pay the work of four shillings, six d or even nine hours labour time would be sufficient to reproduce its value of s for s six d and conse consequently three hours of surplus labour indeed two would accrue the capitalist and the surplus value would rise from one shilling to, s to one shilling 6D. This result, however, could be attained by pushing the wage of the worker down below the value of his labour power. With the 4S 6D, which he produces nine hours, he commands one tenth less of the means of subsistence than before. And consequently, the reproduction of his labour power can only take place in a stunted form. The surplus labour would in this case be prolonged only by transgressing its normal limits. Its domain would be extended only by an absorption, a part of the domain necessary labour time. Despite, despite the important part which this method plays in practice, we excluded from considering it here by our assumption that all commodities, including labour power, are bought and sold at their full value. If we assume this, it follows that labour time necessarily that the labour time necessary for the production of labour power or the reproduction of its value cannot be lessened by a fall in the worker's wage below the value of his labour power, but only by a fall in this value itself. Given the length of the working day, the prolongation of the surplus labour must of necessity originate in the curtailment of a necessary labour time. The latter cannot arise from the former. In the example we chose, the value of labour power and had to fall, in fact by one-tenth in order for the necessary labour time to diminish by one-tenth, i.e. from, from ten hours to nine. The surplus labour to consequently be prolonged from two hours to three. A fall of this kind in the value of labour power implies, however, that the same means of subsistence formerly produced in ten hours can now be produced in nine hours. But this is impossible without an increase in the productivity of labour. For example, suppose a cobbler with a given set of tools makes one pair of boots in one working day of 12 hours. If he is to make two pairs of in the same time, the productivity of his labour must be doubled. And this cannot be done except by an alteration in his tools or in his mode of working or both. Hence the conditions of production of his labour, i.e. his mode of production and the labour process itself, must be revolutionised. By an increase in the productivity of labour, we mean an alteration in the labour process of such kind as to shorten the labour time socially necessary for the production of the commodity and to endow a given quantity of labour with the power of producing a greater quantity of use value. Hitherto, in dealing with the production of surplus value in the above form, we assumed that the mode of production is given and invariable. But when surplus value has to be produced by the conversion of necessary labour into surplus labour, it is by no means suffices for capital to take over the labour process in its given or historically transmitted shape. 
and then simply to prolong its duration. The technical and social conditions of the process and consequently the mode of production itself must be revolutionised before the productivity of labour can be increased. Then, with the increase in the fall of within in the productivity of labour, the value of labour power will fall and the proportion of the working day necessary for the production of that sur that value will be shortened. I call that surplus value, which is produced by the lengthening of the working day, absolute surplus value. In contrast to this, I call that surplus value, which arises from the curtailment of the necessary labour time from the corresponding alteration in respect to the length of the two components of the working day, relative surplus value. In order to make the value power go down, the rise in productivity of labour must seize upon the, these, those branches of industry whose products determine the value of labour power and consequently either belong to the category of normal means of subsistence or are capable of replacing them. But the value of commodity is determined not only by the quantity of labour which gives it its final form, but also by the quantity of labour contained by the instruments in the instruments by which it has been produced. For instance, the value of a pair of boots depends not only on the labour of the cobbler, but also on the value of the leather, wax, thread, etc. Hence, a fall in the value of labour power is also brought about by an increase in the productivity of labour and by a corresponding cheapening of the commodities in those industries which supply the instruments of labour and the material for labour, i.e. the physical elements of constant capital which are required for producing the means of subsistence. But an increase in the productivity of labour in the, those branches of industry which, neither, which supply neither the necessary means of subsistence or the means by which they are produced leaves the value of labour power undisturbed. The cheapening of the commodity, of course, causes only a relative fall in the value of labour power. A fall proportional to the extent to which that commodity enters into the reproduction of labour power. Shirts, for example, are a necessary means of subsistence, but they are only one of many. The total sum of the necessary means of subsistence, however, consists of variable commodities, each the product of distinct industry, and the value of each of those commodities enters as a component part into the value of labour power. The latter value decreases with the decrease of the labour necessary, labour time necessary for its reproduction. The total decrease of necessary labour time is equal to the sum of all the different reductions in labour time which have occurred in those various distinct branches of production. Here we treat the general result as if it were the direct result and the direct purpose of each individual case. When an individual capitalist cheapens shirts, for example, by increasing the productivity of labour, he by no means necessarily aims to reduce the value of labour power and shorten the necessary labour time in proportion to this, but he contributes towards increasing the general rate of surplus value only insofar as he ultimately contributes to this result. The general and necessary tendencies of capital must be distinguished from their forms of appearance. While it is not our intention here to consider the way in which the imminent laws of capitalist production manifest themselves in the external movement of the individual capitals assert themselves as the coercive laws of competition and therefore in enter into the consciousness of the individual capitalist as he motives, as the motives which drive him forward. This, is, this much is clear. A scientific, scientific analysis of competition is possible only if we can grasp the inner nature of capital. Just as the only motions 
of the heavenly bodies which are intelligible, just as someone who is acquainted with their real motions which are necessary perceptible to the senses. Nevertheless, for the understanding of the production of relatively relative surplus value, and merely on the basis of the result already achieved, we may add the following remarks. If one hour's labour is embodied in 6D, the value of 6D will be proportionally re produced in the working day of 12 hours. Suppose that with the labour of with the labour of the currently produ prevailing production 12 articles are produced in these 12 hours let the value of the means of production used up in each article be 6d under the circumstances each article is 6d for the value of the means of production Oh God. A drawing one. Yeah. If one hour's labour is embodied in 6D, a value of 6S will be produced in a working day of 12 hours. Suppose that with labour of the currently prevailing productivity, 12 articles are produced in this 12 hours. Let the value of the means of production used up in each article be 6D. Under these circumstances, each article yeah. costs 1S. 6D for the value of the means of production and 6D for the value added in by working on those means. Now, now let some, someone capitalist contrive to double the productivity of labour and produce 24 instead of 12 articles in the course of a working day of 12 hours. The value of the means of production remaining the same. The value of each article will fall to 9D, making up of 6D for the value of the means of production and 3D for the value newly added by the labour. Even though the productivity of labour has been doubled, the day's labour creates, as before, a new value of 6s, and no more, which is now, however, spread over twice as many articles. Each article now has embodied in its 1 24th of this value instead of 1 12th. 3d instead of 6d, or what amounts to the same thing? Only half an hour of labour time instead of a whole hour is now added to the means of production while they are being transformed into each article. The individual value of these articles is now below their social value. In other words, they have cost less labour time than the great bulk of the same article produced under the average social conditions. Each article costs an average 1S and represents two hours of social labour. But under the altered mode of production, it only costs 9D, or contains only one and a half hours labour. The real value of a commodity, however, is not its individual, but social value. That is to say, its value is not measured by the labour time that the article costs the producer in the individual case, but the labour time socially required for its production. If, therefore, the capitalist who applies the new method to sells his commodity at its social value of one shilling, he sells it for 3D above its initial value, and thus he realises an extra surplus value of 3D. On the other hand, the working day of 12 hours is now represented for him by 24 articles instead of 12. Hence, in order to get rid of the product of one working day, the demand must be double what it was, i.e. the market must become twice as extensive. Other things being equal, the capitalist commodities can only command a more extensive market if their prices are reduced. 
He will therefore sell them above their individual, but below their social value, say at 10 d each, but this means he still squeezes an extra surplus value of one penny out of each. This augmentation of surplus value is pocketed by the capitalist himself, whether or not his commodities belong to the class of necessarily means of subsistence, and therefore participate in determining the general value of labour power. Hence, quite independently of this, there is a motive for each individual capitalist to cheapen his commodities by increasing the productivity of labour. Nevertheless, even in this case, the increased production of surplus value arises from the curtailment of a necessarily labour time and the corresponding prolongation of the surplus value. Let the necessary labour time amount to 10 hours, the value of a day's labour to 5s, the surplus labour to 2 hours and the daily surplus value to 1d. But each the capitalist, but the capitalist now produces 24 articles which he sells at one tenth each, making 20s, 20s in all. Since the value of means of production is 12, 14 and two fifths of these articles merely replace the constant capital advance. The value, the labour of the of 12 hour working day is represented by the remaining nine and three fifths articles. Since the price of the labour power is 5s, six articles represents the necessary labour time, and three and three fifth articles the surplus labour. The ratio of necessary labour to, to surplus labour, which under average social conditions was 5 to 1, is now only 5 to 3. We may, may arrive at the same result in the following way. The value of the work of the product of the working day of 12 hours is 20s. Of this sum, 12s represents the value of the means of production, a value that merely reappears in the finished product. There remains 8s, which are the expression of in money, of the value created during the working day. This sum is greater than the sum in which the average social labour of the same kind is expressed. Twelve hours in the latter labour are expressed by only six. The exceptional, exceptionally productive labour acts as intensified, intensified labour. It creates in equal periods of time greater values than average social labour of the same kind. But a capitalist still continues to pay, as before, only 5s as the daily value of labour power. Hence, instead of 10 hours, the worker now needs to work only for 7 and 1 fifth hours in order to reproduce this value. His surplus, therefore, increased by 12, 2 and 4 fifth hours and the surplus value he produces grows from 1 into 3. Hence the capitalist who applies to the improved method of production appropriates and devotes to surplus labour a greater proportion of the working day than other capitalists in the same business. He does an individual, as an individual, what capital itself as a whole when engaged with producing relative surplus value. On the other hand, however, this extra surplus value vanishes as soon as the new method of production is generalised. For then, the commodity between the difference between individual value of a cheapened commodity and its social value vanishes. The law of the determination of value by labour time makes itself felt to the individual capitalist who applies a new method of production by compelling him to sell his goods under their social value. In this same law, acting as a coercive law of competition forces his competitors to adopt the new method. The general rate of surplus value is therefore ultimately affected by the general rate
sorry, affected by the whole process only when the increase of the productivity of labour has seized upon those branches of production and cheapen those commodities that contribute towards the necessary means of subsistence and are therefore elements of the value of labour power. The value of commodities stands in inverse ratio to the productivity of labour. So too does the value of labour power since it depends on the values of commodities. Relative surplus value, however, is directly proportional to the productivity of labour. It rises and falls yeah, together with money. productivity. The value of money being assumed to be constant on average working day is 12 hours. Always produces the same new value success, no matter how the sum may be a pro portion between surplus value and wages. But if, as a result of increased in productivity, there is a fail in the a fall in the value of the means of subsistence, and the daily value of labour power is therefore reduced from 5s to, to 3, the surplus value will increase from 1 to 3. 10 hours were necessary for the reproduction of the value of the labour power now only six are required. Four hours have been set free and can be annexed to the domain of surplus labour. Capital, therefore, has an imminent drive and a constant tendency towards increasing the productivity of labour in order to cheapen commodities and by cheapening commodities to cheapen the worker himself. The absolute value of a commodity is, in itself, of no interest to the capitalist who produces it. All that interests him is the surplus value present in it, which can be realised by sale. The absolute value of a commodity is, in itself, of no interest to the capitalist who produces it. All that interests him is the surplus value present in it, which can be realised by sale. Realisation of the surplus value necessarily carries with it the replacement of the value advanced. Now since relative surplus value increases in direct proportion to the development of, product, of the productivity of labour while the value of commodities stands in precisely the opposite relation to the growth of productivity. Since the same process both cheapens commodities and augments the surplus value contained in them we have here the solution of the following riddle. Why does the capitalist, whose sole concern it is to produce exchange value, continually strive to bring down the exchange value of commodities? One of the founder, founders of political economy, Kinsey, used to torment his opponents with this question, and they could find no answer to it. You acknowledge, he says, that the more one can reduce it, reduce the expenses and cost of labour in the manufacture of industrial pro products without injury to production, the more advantage is that reduction, because it diminishes the price of the finished article, and yet you believe that the production of wealth, which arises from the labour of craftsmen, consists in the augmentation of the exchange values of their products. In the shortening of the working day, therefore, is by no means what is aimed at in the capitalist, in capitalist production. When labour is economised by increasing its production, it is only the shortening of the labour time necessary for the production of a definite quantity of commodities that it is aimed at. The fact that the worker, when the productivity of his labour has been increased, produces, say, ten times as many commodities as before, and thus spends one-tenth as much labour time on each, by no means prevents him from continuing to work twelve hours before as before, nor producing those twelve hours 1,200 articles instead of 120. Indeed, he, indeed his working day may simultaneously be prolonged as to make him produce, say, 1,400 articles in 14 hours. Therefore, in the treatise of economists 
economist like of the stamp of McCulloch, Er, Senior and the like, we may read on one page that the worker owes a debt of gratitude to capital for developing his productivity because the necessary labour time is thereby shortened and in the next page that he must prove his gratitude by working in the future for 15 hours instead of 10. The objective of the development of the productivity of labour within the context of capitalist production is the shortening of that part of the working day in which the worker must work for himself and the lengthening thereby of the other part of the day in which he is free to work for nothing for the capitalist. How far this result can also be attained without cheapening commodities will appear from the following chapters where we examine the particular methods for producing relative surplus value. Capitalist production only really begins, as we have already seen, when each individual capital simultaneously employs a comparatively large number of workers and when, as a result, the labour process is carried on as an, ex at an, on, on an extensive scale and yields relatively large quantities of products. A large number of workers working together at the same time in one place, or if you like, in the same field of labour in order to produce the same sort of commodity under the command of the same capitalist constitutes the starting point of capitalist production. This is both historically true and conceptually. With regard to the mode of production itself, manufacture can hardly be distinguished in its earlier stages from the handicraft trades of the guilds except by the greater number of workers simultaneously employed by the same individual capital. It's merely an enlargement of the workshop of the master craftsmen of the guilds. At first, then, the difference is purely quantitative. We have shown that the surplus value produced by a given capital is equal to the surplus value produced by each worker multiplied by the number of workers simultaneously employed the number of workers does not in itself affect either the rate of surplus value or the degree of exploitation of labour power and with regard to the production of commodity values in general every qualitative alteration in the labour process appears to be irrelevant if a working What's this space? chapter 13 cooperation capitalist production only really begins as we've already seen, when each individual capital simultaneously employs a comparatively large number of workers and when as a result the labour process is carried on, and it, on, on an extensive scale and yields relatively large quantities of products. A large number of workers working together at the same time in one place if you like, on the same field of labour, in order to produce the same sort of commodity under the command of the same capitalists constitutes the starting point of capitalist production. This is both true historically and conceptually with regard to the mode of production itself, manufacture. Manufacture can hardly be distinguished in its earlier stages from the handicraft of the guilds except by the greater number of workers simultaneously employed by the same individual capital. It is merely an enlargement of the workshop of the master craftsmen of the guilds. At first then the difference is purely quantitative. We have shown that the surplus value produced by a given number, given capital, is equal to the surplus value produced by each worker multiplied by the number of workers simultaneously employed. The number of workers does not in itself affect the rate of surplus value or the degree of exploitation of labour power. And with, with regard to the production of commodity values in general, every qualitative alteration in the labour process appears to be irrelevant. If a working day of 12 hours is subjectified in 6 shillings, 1,200 working days of 12 hours will be objectified in 1,200 times 6 shillings. In one case, 
12 times 1,200 working hours are incorporated in the products and in the case 12 working hours in the production of value. A number of workers merely rank as so many individual workers. It, is there, it therefore makes no difference if the value produced whether the 1,200 men work separately or united under the command of one capitalist. Nevertheless, with certain, within certain limits, a modification does take place. The labour objectified in value is the labour of an average social quality. It is an expression of average labour power. An average magnitude, however, is merely the average number of separate magnitudes, all in one kind, but differing in quality. In every industry, each individual worker differs from the average worker. These individual differences or errors, as they are called in mathematics, compensate each other and vanish whether a certain minimum number of workers are employed together. Edmund Burke, that famous sophist and sycophant, goes so far to make the following assertion based on his practical observations as a farmer, that in no small platoon as that five farm labourers, all individual differences in the labour vanish, and that consequently any given five adult farm labourers labourers taken together will do as much work in the same time as any other five. But however that may be, it's clear that the collective working day of a large number of workers employed simultaneously, divided by the number of these workers, gives one day of average social labour. For example, let the working day of each individual be 12 hours. Then the collective working day of 12 men simultaneously employed consists of 144 hours. And of all, although the labour of each of a dozen men diverge more or less from the average social labour, each of them requiring a different amount of time for the same operation, the working day of everyone possesses the qual qualities of an average social working day because it forms one twelfth of the collective working day of 144 hours. From the point of view of the capitalist who employs these 12 men, the working day is that of the whole dozen. Each individual man's day is an aliquot part of the collective working day, no matter whether the 12 men, 12 men help each other in their work or whether the connection between their operations consists merely in the fact that the men are all working for the same capitalist. But if the 12 men are employed in six pairs by six different small masters, it will be, entirely, be an entirely different matter of chance whether each of these masters produces the same value, and consequently whether he secures the general rate of surplus value. Divergences would occur in individual cases, if one worker required considerably more time for the production of a commodity than was socially necessary, the duration of necessary labour time would, in this case, diverge significantly from the labour time socially necessary. The average labour time. His labour would therefore not count as average labour, and his labour power would not count as average labour power. It would either be unsaleable or saleable only at less than the average value of labour power. A fixed minimum of efficiency in all labour is therefore assumed, as we shall see later on, that the capitalist production provides the means of fixing this minimum. Nevertheless, this minimum diverges from the average, although, on the other hand, the capitalist has to pay the average value of labour power. Of the six small masters, then one would squeeze out more than the average rate of surplus value, and nevertheless, the inequalities would cancel out for the society as a whole, but not for the individual masters. The law of valorization is therefore comes fully into its own for the individual producer, only when he produces as a capitalist and employs a number of workers simultaneously, when from the outside set he sets a motion labour of a socially average character. Even without an alteration, K 
capitalist production only really begins, as we have seen, when each individual capital simultaneously employs okay. Even without an alteration in the method of work, the simultaneous employment of a large of large number of workers produces a revolution in the objective conditions of the labour process. The building where the workers actually work, the storehouses, the raw materials, the implements and utensils they use simultaneously or in turns. In short, a proportion of the means of production are now consumed jointly by the labour process on the one hand. The exchange value of these means of production is not increased. For so the exchange value of a commodity is not raised by any increase in the exploitation of its use value. On the other hand, they are used in common and therefore on a larger scale than before. A room where 20 weavers work at 20 looms must be larger than a room of a single weaver with two assistants but it costs less to build one workshop for 20 persons than to build 10 to accommodate two weavers each. Thus the value of means of production concentrated for use in one in common on a large scale does not increase in direct proportion to extent and useful effect. When consumed in common, they give up a smaller part of their value to each single product, partly because the total value they play they part with is spread over a great number of products and partly because their value, although it is greater in absolute terms, is relatively less. Looked at from the point of view of their sphere of action than their value of separate means of production owing to this, the value of a part of the constant capital falls and in, pro and in proportion to the size of its fall, the total value of the commodity also falls. The effect is the same as if a means of production had cost less. This economy in the application of the means of production arises entirely out of their joint consumption in the labour process by many workers. Moreover, this character of being necessarily condition of social labour, a character that distinguishes them from the dispersed and relatively more costly means of production of isolated independent workers or small masters is maintained even when the numerous workers assembled together do not assist each other but merely work both side by side. A proportion, a portion of the instruments of labour acquires this social character before the labour process itself does. Economy in the use of the means of production has to be considered from two points of view. Firstly, in so far as it cheapens commodities and thereby brings about the fall in value of labour power. Secondly, in so far as it alters the ratio of surplus value to the total capital advance, i.e. to the sum of values, its constant and variable components. The latter aspect will not be considered until the first section of Volume 3 of this work, in order that we may treat them in the proper context. Many other points relevant here have also been relegated to the third volume. The particular course taken by analysis forces this tearing apart of the object under invigilation. This corresponds also to the spirit of capitalist production. Here the worker finds the instruments of labour existing independently of him as another man's property, hence economy in their use appears from his standpoint to be a separate, com separate operation one that does not concern him and therefore has no connection with the methods by which his own personal productivity is increased. When numerous workers work side by side in accordance with a plan, whether in the same process or in different but connected processes, this form of labour is called cooperation. Just as the offensive power of a squadron of cavalry or the defensive power of an infantry regime is essentially different from the sum of the offensive or defensive posters of the individual soldiers taken separately, so the sum of total the sum total of the mechanical forces exerted on by isolated workers differs from the so social force that is developed when many hands cooperate in the same undivided operation, such as raising a heavy weight 
turning a winch or, or getting an obstacle out of the way. In such cases, the effect of the combined labour could either not be produced at all by isolated individual labour, or it could be produced not only by great expenditure of time, or on a very dwarf-like scale. Not only do we have here an increase in the productive power of the individual by means of cooperation, but the creation of new productive power, which is, in, an intrinsic, which is intrinsically a collective one. Apart from the new power that arises from the fusion of many forces into a single force, mere social contracts begets, in most industries, a rivalry and a simultaneous stimulation of the animal spirits which heightens the efficiency of each individual worker. This is why a dozen people working together would produce far more in their collective working day of 144 hours than 12 isolated men each working for 12 hours and far more than one man who works 12 hours in succession. This originates from the fact that man, if not as Aristotle thought, a political animal is, at all events, a social animal. Although a number of men may simultaneously be occupied together on the same work or the same kind of work, the labour of each as part of the labour of all may correspond to a distinct phase of the labour process and result in the system of cooperation. The object of labour passes through the phases of the process much more quickly than before. For instance, a double dumb dozen masons place themselves in a row so as to pass stones from the foot of a ladder to its summit. Each one of, the, one of them does the same thing, and yet their separate acts form connected parts of one total operation. These acts are particular phases in which each stone must go through, and the stones are thus carried out more quickly by the 24 hands of the rose row of men than they would if each man went separately up and down the ladder with his load. The object, object of labour is carried over the same distance in a shorter time. Again, a combination of labour occurs whenever a building, for instance, is taken in hand on different sides simultaneously. Although here too, the cooperate, cooperating masons are doing the same work, or the same kind of work, the 12 masons in their collective working day of 144 hours make much more progress with the building than one mason would make for 12 days or 144 hours. The reason for this is that the body of men working today together have hands and eyes both in front, of, both in front and behind and can be said to be, to a certain extent, omnipresent. The various parts of the product come to fruition simultaneously. If in the, above, in the above instances we stress the point that men do, do the same work or the same kind of work because this is the most simple form of common labour, plays a great part in cooperation even at its most fully developed stage. If the labour process is complicated then the sheer number of the cooperators permits the appointment, apportionment of various operations to different hands and consequently their simultaneous performance. The time necessary for completion of the whole work is thereby shortened. In many industries there are critical moments, that is to say periods of time determined by nature of the labour process itself during which certain definite results must be obtained. For instance, if a flock of sheep has to be shorn or a field of wheat has to be cut and harvested, the quantity and quality of the product depends on the initiation and the completion of the work at certain definite points in time. In these cases, the time the labour process may take is laid down in advance, just as it is finishing for herring, fishing, as it is in fishing for herrings. A single person cannot carve a working day of more than, say, 12 hours out of a natural day, but a hundred men cooperating can extend the working day to 1,200 hours. The shortness of the time allowed for the work is compensated for by the large mass of labour thrown in the field of production at the decisive moment. The completion of the task 
within the proper time depends on the simultaneous application of numerous combined working days. The amount of useful effect depends on the number of workers. This number, however, is always smaller than the number of isolated workers that would be required to do the same amount of work in the same period. It is owing to the absence of this kind of cooperation that a great deal of corn is wasted every year in the western parts of the United States. And the same thing happens to cotton in those eastern parts of India where English rule has destroyed the old communities. On the one hand, cooperation allows work to be carried on over a large area for certain labour processes. Therefore, it is required simply by the physical constitution of the object of labour. Examples of this are in the draining of marshes, the construction of dikes, irrigation and the building of canals, roads and railways. On the other hand, while extending the scale of production, it renders possible, renders possible a relative contradiction of its arena. This simultaneous restriction of space and extension of effectiveness which allows a large number of incidental expenses well free to be spared result, results from the massing together workers of various labour processes and from the concentration of the means of production. The combined working day produces a greater quantity of use values than an equal sum of isolated working days and consequently diminishes the labour time necessary for the production of a given useful effect. Whether the combined working day in a given case acquires this increased productivity because it heightens the mechanical force of labour or extends its sphere of action over a greater space or contracts the field of production relatively to the scale of production or at the critical moment sets large masses of labour to work or excites rivalry between individuals and raises their animal spirits or impresses the similar operations carried on by a number of men. The stamp of continuity and many-sidedness or performs different operations simultaneously or economies economizes the means of production by use in common or lens or lends to individual labour the character of average social labour. Whichever in this, in, of these is the case of the increase, the special productive power of the combined working day is, under all the circumstances, the social productive power of labour or the productive power of social labour. This power arises from the cooperation itself. When the worker co cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off the fetters of his individuality and develops the capabilities of his species. As a general rule, workers cannot cooperate without being brought together. Their assembly line in one place is a necessarily necessary condition for their cooperation. Hence, wage labourers cannot cooperate unless they are employed simultaneously at the same time by the same capital, the same capitalist, and then for, therefore unless the labour powers are bought simultaneously by him. The total value of these labour powers, or the amount of the wages these workers, of these workers for a day or week, as the case may be, must be ready in the pocket of the capitalists before the workers themselves are ready to start the process of production. The payment of 300 workers at once, even though only for one day, requires a greater number of outlay of capital than the payment of a smaller number of men week by week during a whole year. Hence the number of the workers the number of workers the workers that cooperate or the scale of cooperation depends on the in the first instance on the amount of capital that the individual capitalist can spare for purchase of labour power. In other words, on the extent to which a single capitalist has command over the means of subsistence of number of workers. And as with variable capital, 
So also with constant capital. For example, the outlay of, on raw material is 30 times as great for the capitalist who employs 300 men as it is for the 30, cap 30 capitalists who employ 10 men. The value and quantity of instruments of labour used in common does not, it is true, increase at the same rate as the number of workers, but it does increase very considerably. Hence, the concentration of large masses of the means of production in the hands of individual capitalists is a material condition for the cooperation of wage labourers, and the, the extent of cooperation or the scale of production depends on the state of this concentration. We saw in a former chapter that a certain number of minimum amounts of capital was necessary in order that the number of workers sim simultaneously employed and the consequently the amount of surplus value produced might suffice to liberate the, num the employer himself from manual labour, to convert him from a small master into a capitalist, and thus formally to establish this, the capital relation. We now see that a certain num minimum amount of material condition for the conversion of numerous isolated and independent processes into one combined social process. We also saw at first that the subject of labour to capital was only a formal result of the fact that the worker, instead of working for himself, he works, works for and consequently under the capitalist through the cooperation of numerous wage labourers the command of capital develops into a requirement for carrying on the labour process itself into a real condition of production. That a capitalist should command in the field of production is now indispensable as that, as that a general should command in the field of battle. All direct social communal la labour on a large scale requires to a greater or lesser degree directing authority in order to secure the harmonious co cooperation of the activities of individuals and to perform the general functions that have their own origin in the motion of the total productive organism as distinguished from the motion of its separate organs. A single violin player is his own conductor. An orchestra requires a separate one. The work directing the super and superintending and adjusting the becomes one of the functions of capital. From the moment that the labour and the capital, the directing functions acquires its own special characteristics. The driving motive and determining purpose of capitalist production is the self-valorisation of capital to the greatest possible extent, i.e. the greatest possible production of surplus value hence the greatest possible exploitation of labour power by the capitalists. As the number of cooperating, cooperating work, workers increases, so too does their resistance to the domination of capital, and necessarily the pressure put on by capital to overcome this resistance. The control exercised by the capitalists is not only a special function arising from the nature of the social labour process, and peculiar to that process, but uh, it is at the same time a function of the exploitation of the social labour process and it's consequently conditioned by the unavoidable antagonism between the exploiter and the raw material of his exploitation. Similarly, as a means of production extend, the necessity increases for some effective control over the proper alien application of them because they confront the wage labourer wage labor as the property of an another. another. Moreover, the cooperation of the wage labour is entirely brought about by the capital that employs them. Their unification into one single productive body and the establishment of a connection between their individual functions lies outside their competence. These things are not their own act, but the act of the capital that brings them together and maintains them in situation. Hence the interconnection between their various labours confronts them in the realm of ideas as a plan drawn up by the capitalist and in practice as his authority as the powerful will of being outside them. 
who subjects their activity to his purpose. If capitalist direction is twofold in content owing to the twofold nature of the process of production which has to be directed on the one hand as the social labour process for the creation of a product and on the other hand capital's process of valorisation in a form in form is purely despotic. As cooperation extends its scale, this despotism despotism God. develops a form forms that are particular to it. Just at that as as at the first capitalist is relieved from the actual labour. His capital has reached that maximum amount from which capitalist production, properly speaking, first begins. So now he hands over the work of, the, of direct and constant supervision of the individual workers. Sorry, now. First begins, so now he hands over the work of direct and constant supervision of the individual workers and the groups of workers to a special kind of wage labour. An industrial army of workers under the command of, capitalist, of a capitalist requires, like a real army of officers, managers and NCOs, foremen over like a real army officers and NCOs, overseers who command the labour process in the name of capital. The work of supervision becomes their established and exclusive function. When comparing the mode of production of isolated peasants or independent artisans with the plantation economy which rests on slavery, political economists count this labour of superintendents as part of the full fray to production. But when considering the capitalist mode of production, they on the contrary identified the function of direction which arises out of the nature of the communal labour process in the function of direction which is made necessary by the capitalist and therefore antagonistic character of that process. It's not because he is the leader of the industry that man is a capitalist. On the contrary, he is the leader of interest industry because he is a capitalist. The leadership of the industry is an attribute of capital, just as in feudal times the function of general and judge were attributes of the landed property. The worker is the owner of his labour power until he has finished bargaining for its sale with the capitalist, and he can sell no more than that he has. His individual isolated labour power this relationship between capital and labour is in no way altered by the fact that the capitalist, instead of buying the labour power of one man, buys 100 and enters into separate contracts with 100 unconnected men of, of with one. He can set the 100 men to work without letting them cooperate. He pays them a value of 100 independent labour powers, but he does not pay for the combined labour power of a hundred. Being independent of each other, the workers are isolated. They enter into relations with the capitalists, but not with each other. Their cooperation only begins with the labour work process, but by then they have ceased to belong to themselves. On entering the labour process, they are incorporated into capital as cooperate cooperators and as members of a working organism. They merely form a particular mode of existence of capital, hence the productive power developed by the worker socially is the productive power of capital. Their socially productive powers of labour develops as a free gift to capital whenever the workers are placed under certain conditions, and it is capital which places them under these conditions. 
because this power costs capital nothing, while on the other hand it is not developed by the worker until his labour itself belongs to capital, it appears to have a power which capital possesses by nature, by its nature, a productive power inherent in capital. The colossal effects of simple cooperation are to be seen in the gigantic structures erected by the ancient Asiatics, Egyptians, Etruscans, etc. It happened in times past that these oriental states, after supplying the expense of their civil and military establishments, have found themselves in possession of a surplus which they could apply to work, to works of magnificence or utility, and almost, and in con the construction of these, their command over the lands and arms of almost the entire non agricultural population has produced stupendous moments which still indicate their power. The teeming of the Valley Nile produced food for swarming non agricultural population, and this food belonged, belonging to the monarch, the priesthood, and the priesthood afforded the means of erecting the mighty monuments which filled the land. In moving the colossal statues, statues and vast masses of which the transport creates wonder, human nature almost alone was prodigally used. The number of labourers and, and the concentration of their efforts sufficed we see mighty coral reefs rising from the depths of the ocean into islands and firm land, yet each individual depositor is puny, weak and contemptible. The non-agricultural labourers of the Asiatic monarchy have little but their individual bodily excursion to bring to the task, but the num their number is their strength, and the powers directing these masses gave rise to the palaces and temples of pyramids and the armies of gigantic structures of which the remains the astonish, astonish and perplex us. It is the confinement of the revenues which feed them to one or two hands, which makes under such undertakings possible. This, the power, this power of the Asiatic and Egyptian kings, or of the Etruscan theocrats, etc., has in modern society been transferred to the capitalists. Whether he appears as an isolated individualist, individual, or, in the case of joint stock companies, in the combination with others, cooperation in the labour process, such as we find it at the beginning of human, human civilization among hunting people, or say, as a predominant feature of the agricultural agriculture of Indian communities, is based on the one hand on the common ownership of the conditions of production and on the other hand on the fact that those cases the individual has as little torn himself free from his umbilical cord of his tribe or community as a bee as from his hive. Both these characteristics distinguish this form of cooperation from capitalist cooperation. The sporadic application of cooperation on a large scale in ancient times in the Middle Ages and in modern colonies rests on the relations of domination and servitude, in most cases on slavery. As against this, the capitalist form presupposes from the outset the free wage labourer who sells his labour power to capital. Historically, however, this form is developed in opposition to a peasant agriculture and independent agricrafts, whether in guilds or not. From the standpoint of the peasant and the artisan, capitalist cooperation does not appear as a particular historical form of co cooperation. Instead, cooperation itself appears as a historic form peculiar to and specifically distinguishing the capitalist process of production. Just as the social productive power of labour that is developed by cooperation appears to be the productive power of capital. The so cooperation itself so cooperation itself contrasted with a process of production carried on by isolated independent workers. 
even by small masters, appear to be a specific form of a capitalist process of production. It is the first change experienced by the actual labour process when subject to capital. It takes place spontaneously and naturally. The simultaneous employment of a large number of wage labourers in the same process, which is a necessary condition for this change, also forms the starting point of capitalist production. This starting point coincides with the birth of capitalists itself. If, then, on the one hand, the capitalist mode of production is a historically necessary condition for the transformation of the labour process into a social process, so, on the other hand, this social form of the labour process is a method employed by the capital for the more profitable exploitation of labour by increasing its productive power. In its simple shape, as investigated so far, cooperation is a necessary concomitant of all production on a large scale, but it not, does not itself represent a fixed form of characteristic, form characteristic of a particular epoch at the development of the capitalist mode of production. At the most it appears to do so, and then only approximately in the handicraft-like beginnings of the manufacture and in that large-scale agriculture which corresponds to the period of manufacture and is distinguished from peasant agriculture, mainly by the number of workers simultaneously employed and the mass of means of production concentrated for their use. Simple cooperation has always been and continues to be the predominant form in those branches of production in which capital operates on a large scale, but the division of labour and machinery only play an insignificant part. Cooperation remains the fundamental form of the capitalist mode of production, although its simple shape it continues to appear as one particular form alongside more developed ones. The division of labour and manufacture. The dual origin of manufacture. That form of cooperation, which is based on division of labour, assumes its classical shape in manufacture. As a characteristic form of the capitalist process of production, it prevails through the manufacturing period, properly is so called, which extends, roughly speaking, from the middle of the 16th century to the last third of the 16th. 18th century. Manufacturing originates in two ways. One, by assembling together in one workshop under the control of a single capitalist of workers belonging to various independent handicrafts, through whose hands given an article must pass its way to completion. A carriage, for example, was formerly the product of a great number of independent craftsmen, such as wheelwrights, harness makers, tailors, locksmiths, upholsters, turners, fringe makers, glaciers, painters, polishers, gilders, etc. In the manufacture of carriages, however, all these different craftsmen are assembled into one building, where the unfinished product passes from hand to hand. It's true that a carriage cannot be gilded before it's been made, but if a number of carriages are being made simultaneously, some may be in the hands of the gilders while others are going through, earlier process, through an earlier process. So far, we are on the footing of a simple cooperation which finds its materials ready to hand in the shape of men and things. But very soon, an important change takes place. The tailor, the locksmith, the other craftsmen are now exclusively occupied in the making of carriages. They therefore gradually lose the habit and therefore the ability to carry on their old trade in all its ramifications. But on the one hand, their activity, which is now entirely one-sided, assumes a form most appropriate to its narrow sphere of effectiveness.